come into our hearts and into our lives and change us so that through us, you can change our world, the, the world that we move around in, and that you can love others through us. Because, Lord, on our own, we can't do it. We, we can't. We're, we are not equal to the task. But, Lord, you can use each one of us individually in, in the worlds that you've put us in. And, Lord, that's what I pray right now, that you would empty us of us, of our individual agendas, of our desires, of our, of our reservations, of everything that, that we have that holds us back. Lord, empty us of that. And just love people through us and shine through us to a world that is so broken and so hurting and so in need of you. They don't need us, Lord. They need you, just like we do, Lord. We need you, and we come before you this morning. We come before you today saying that we need you. We need you in our lives, and we need you to change us, to make us what you would have us to be so that we can be used by you. Thank you, Lord, for being here with us today, and we ask that you continue to be with us in this service. In your name, we pray.
to welcome you all to Waypoint this morning. It was uh, pretty frosty this morning. I'm sure if you were up early enough, there was some frost on the ground, which I'm still trying to get used to. We just moved into a new house and we're trying to get used to the fact that, you know, you get used to whether or not it's too cold or too warm in the morning and we haven't quite figured that out yet, but we're trying to get used to it. So we were pretty much frozen this morning when we woke up, but we'll, we'll get it one of these days. It's where I'm not used to the coldness yet, but you know, it's Michigan. We'll get used to it. So thank you for standing and uh, please continue to join with us as we sing this morning. We're going to sing a song called Trust in You. Ushers to come forward just as we continue worshiping God through the giving of our gifts, tithes, and offerings. And let me pray for us as they come forward. Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you that we can gather together. And Lord, we pray that we would just continue to seek you, to shine brightly for you as your witnesses. Lord, please bless both the gift and the giver. And, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Jeanette and crew for just an amazing morning. So great to have you guys here. Some quick announcements we wanted to share with you. First, there's this red friendship folder. If you don't mind, just sign in and, and just let us know you're here. Let us know updated information, and that's helpful uh, to us for staying in touch with you. Hey, uh, some cool things going on, and here at Waypoint, we try to partner and do deeper partnerships as opposed to spreading ourselves too thin. So locally, regionally, globally, we've got partners that we invest in and, and, uh, and build relationships with throughout the year and, and beyond and just try to go deeper as opposed to, uh, to just wider. And so, so many things are happening in those partnerships. Again, check out these boards, local, regional, and global in our foyer. So many things going on. Today, uh, just keep in mind and pray for a, a crew that's helping with the, the Backroads uh, Marathon. And that supports Blessings in a Backpack, this great, great ministry that happens here in Clarkston for kids to have supplemental uh, lunch uh, during the week. And uh, hey, Women's Banquet is, is coming up. That's December 2nd. More details in the foyer. Uh, check with Amy Lewis or some others for signing up for that. You will not want to miss that great, great day. Our quizzers traveled yesterday, and they, they've been quizzing over the book of Galatians. Yesterday, they quizzed over all six chapters, and uh, so proud of our crew, and you guys, uh, we, we love you guys. Great, great work on that. To help our quizzers and teens and others, there's some, uh, some greenery that's for sale through Wojo's, and this is a great fundraiser to help our teens and, and, and people be able to do some events like Spring Hill and some great, great stuff. So, so check out that display in the foyer for that. Also, uh, many things going on. Again, uh, we announced gifts for all God's children. I think we're in the 40s as far as kids sponsored, and we want to get that number back up around 100 where it was uh, last year. So check with Shelly Schaefer for more details. See the display in the foyer. So that's going on. And then again, this time of year, we want to highlight seed, and that is a, um, a micro enterprise and just a way of helping people around the world that uh, earn a livable wages. And so this is a great time as you consider Christmas gifts. Would you uh, check that out online? You can visit our website, our, our Facebook page, and they'll, they'll point you towards Seed as, as a way of purchasing gifts and doing that intentionally to help people literally around the world. So, so check those things out. And then I wanted to mention to you guys that uh, on December 25th and January 1, uh, those are each Sundays, so that is Christmas Day and, and New Year's Day are each on Sundays. We just want to highlight and make you guys aware just one service on those days and, uh, and just plan on that at 11 o'clock. We'll have some special times those mornings. I got a buddy, Todd Traver. Are you in here? Oh, goody, 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 goody. Hey, so Bitter Back, yeah, yeah, you get, you get some serious love on this one, man. So a bit of background, our building has had uh, water leaking uh, I issues in, in through concrete block. Uh, crew, uh, Todd and many others have, uh, <laughs> have, have gone after this project. And you guys, this metal siding has gone up at, from, from the people in our church. And, and Todd, you and so many others have done such an amazing, amazing job. So, hey, talk to us. So I woke up this morning. Yeah. Thought I was working. This is what I got on. <laughs> this is why I wore this. I've been here like so many days. I can't remember whether it's a church day or if it's actually a work well day. indeed you, i'm you, joking about that i you you've been here a because lot. i yeah. wanted to see show that i was working and you wait wait wait, wait, wait no no, no. Oh, hey, that's oh. <laughs> hey uh do you ever wake up and you're just like so sore because you worked so hard the you day did before? because you carried my weight yesterday oh, that's right. why you're so oh, sore right you're too kind man yeah. you're too kind talk to us man so um thanks again for everybody helping out um every week somebody comes up and steps up and i can't i hate to bring up people's names because every time there's something that we need somebody shows up and it was awesome so thanks for all the help um we've got everything secured the building secured um cement wise all that stuff in the wall we found major issues in there once we got into it that solved taken care of saved tons of money doing it ourselves uh, we talked about water intrusion another example we were cleaning out the tubes to get concrete in there and there was actually enough water in there that stuck to our tubes which is crazy yeah, that means good. it's going to take about another year for the building to dry out to actually make it safe again not safe but at least clean and so we don't have any issues so that was another blessing at least we found those things we got to take care of so in the end thanks everybody for showing up this fall and all that stuff next spring we're going to finish up the back wall and then we should be good for 100 years I'll, I'll, I'll be in a nursing home with you in a wheelchair yeah, when the buddy. next time something has to happen. So, <laughs> so anyways, thanks very much. Hey, hey, in several of our conversations, we just talked about how God blessed us so much. And, and any one of these Saturdays could have been taken out with bad weather, yep. and we've had just yep. amazing weather. We've had needs for a lot of people to yep. show up and help out, and people stepped up yep. throughout the week on these Saturdays and, and beyond. So you guys, 
thank you so much for helping us be good so stewards of this resource. Just real quick, resource. there was a, somebody that uh, was a lady that was doing our metal, metal bending, and um, she did it for a living, and her husband um, actually ran the company, and he showed up yesterday out of the blue and finished it up. It was awesome. Amen. Oh. So, anyways, thanks. Yeah, it's cool right. stuff. So, hey, thanks, Todd. Thanks, crew. Hey, ni nice, nice jeans, by the way, man. I'll, I'll wear mine next week. <laughs> Good. Hey, uh, one other one. Dave Van Dis, are you in, in the house? Come on up here. And uh, hey, Dave's here to help us out with a, a big announcement for this, this week. Something very, very important going on that's been going on for several years. And uh, Dave, talk to us, man. What's going on this, uh, this Thursday, Friday? As far as I know, years ago, I was asked to be a part of the situation down at Renaissance Center, serving a turkey luncheon for the youth down there. And I was just so blessed and excited. And uh, it looks like there's a few very important spots on the sign-up sheet yet. And if you feel blessed or tugged, and if, if you could sign up, because we know you're more than competent to do so, you're a super blessing to them. But more important than that, follow God's word, and you will get blessed way above what you can give to them. Amen. And they can see you for details on that, is that correct? You can see me or call Terry. And, and right on and the sign-up board? most of it is a sign-up right on the, at the far wall. Oh, that's great. Thank, Dave, thank you so very much, man. And you guys, this is great, great opportunity. Renaissance High School, we've done this for, my goodness, several years uh, now. And they talk about it, they look forward to it. The staff, the students, they love this. And uh, rumor has it they're preparing something special for their sign for us this week as we, as we go and serve this Thanksgiving meal at, this, uh, at Renaissance High School. So be praying for that, be involved in that, and, and let's be God's witnesses, just as he has called us to. Hey, a couple quick video uh, announcements are gonna be playing right now. This book is the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy. Its precepts are binding. Its histories are true. And its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise. Believe it to be safe. Practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you. Food to support you. And comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map. The pilgrim's staff. The pilot's compass. The soldier's sword. And the Christian's character. Here, paradise is restored. Heaven opened and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject. Our good, its design. And the glory of God, its end. It should fill the memory. Rule the heart. And guide the feet. Read it slowly, prayerfully, frequently. It is a mine of wealth. Paradise of glory. And a river of pleasure. Follow its precepts and it will lead you to Calvary. To the empty tomb. To a resurrected life in Christ. Yes, to glory itself. For eternity. For eternity. For eternity. For eternity. You know, I've heard that agencies that teach people to recognize counterfeit money do so most 
by not having them recognize all the different kinds of counterfeit that's out there, but instead teaching them to spend hours and hours looking at the real deal, the real money, so that they can notice right away something that isn't real. And the same is true with our faith. We say that we believe in the Word of God and that it's our standard for truth and it's the authority of our life. But out there, there are a lot of ideas that are contrary and different than the Word of God. And the only way that we can know that we're following the truth is by making sure that we have spent a lot of time with the real deal. The Bible tells us that there is a way that seems right to people, but in the end, it re leads to death. It also says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Parents, as we're raising our children, we want to know that they know the real deal so that they don't fall um, to all the, the different teachings that are out there and think that they're following the real Jesus because they don't know the word. How do we do that? How do we instill a love for the word? How do we use the word in our discipline? How do we make it the standard of truth and the authority in our homes? That's what our home court's about this next Sunday. If you'd like to come, I'd love all parents and grandparents, you're all invited, but in order to have the resources we need to give you your free gifts, I do need your RSVP. If you can RSVP today in the red friendship folders or email me by tomorrow at carry at waypoint.org, we'll make sure you have a spot for this very important home court advantage for all parents and grandparents. Thanks. Amen. Wisdom is this amazing concept and this, this value, this, this idea, this, this uh, thing that we are to seek, though it would cost us everything. Wisdom is this, is this concept that is difficult to define in just a very concise way. And, and as a matter of fact, you know, reading through Bible dictionaries, I mean, it's just page after page when normally there's just a paragraph or two explaining something. Wisdom goes on and on because it, it's, it's such an abstract and, and sometimes difficult concept to grasp. And sometimes, you know, in a humorous way, we picture wisdom as, as a guy climbing this mountain and getting to the very mountaintop where there's, there's, there's this other guy with a long beard just waiting for him in that moment. And he might say something like, well, the, the oxen are slow, but the earth is patient. In which case, you would you ponder that and say, whoa, that's deep. And, and we picture something wisdom like, something goofy like that. But, but more, more tangibly, I think we'd all be able to point to somebody and say, that person has wisdom in the way that they live their lives. That person isn't easily shaken. That person has a foundation of, of wisdom that comes from God that, that, is, that is contagious or otherwise that I desire to have that. And hopefully we can point to people in our, in our lives that that is true about. And hopefully we are seeking wisdom, just as God's word calls us to, that even though it would cost us everything, we would still pursue it in, the, in this way. And we would live better lives as a result. And so we wanted to make sure to talk about wisdom on this day, on this, this day after the election week. And I'm so thankful for, for Pastor Kyle and for Melanie for leading a, a great concert of prayer last week as we prepared for this this important week uh, for our country and whatever wherever you're at on the political spectrum does doesn't matter to, to us whatsoever what matters is that we seek God in this that we pursue wisdom and so even in times where there is uncertainty as there would be after any election or there there's fears or concerns or or wondering how this this is going to go wisdom is one of the most important things that we could ever seek after as we seek to be God's witnesses, as we seek to love God and love people, just as God has called us to, we need wisdom as we go after this. Because there, there's lots of ways to do it, but to choose the best ones. And so today we are talking about wisdom. And we're going to be taking a look at a, a great passage in the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 is this wonderful, wonderful writing that takes place that talks a lot about wisdom and specifically tells us that wisdom demands a godly perspective. So as we, as we take a look at the book of Ecclesiastes, this is, if you could summarize this book in a sentence or, or two, it'd be one man's journey as he seeks to find fulfillment in life, as he seeks to find purpose. And so we don't know exactly who the author of, of Ecclesiastes is. Most likely it's Solomon, but we don't know that for certain. But there's some hints that you can see on the screen that point to this being Solomon. But he starts off in, in just this very profound way, and he says, meaningless, meaningless, everything 
is meaningless. And you're like, wow, you, you got my attention. And so, so he starts the book this way, and he goes on to describe how he sought fulfillment in money and wealth and riches, how he sought to find fulfillment in fame, in, in accomplishments, or uh, how he sought to find f- fulfillment and purpose in life through pleasure and, and pursuing it that way. And all these came up empty. And he, co- he, if we fast forward to the end of the book, towards the end, he says these same things over and again. Ecclesiastes 12, 8, meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And we're like, wow, that sounds like a fun book. I'll, I'll pick up a copy, right? Okay, but he does conclude with this and these very powerful words as he finishes up gives us a great perspective on the book of Ecclesiastes and upon wisdom. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 to 14, he says this, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. And this powerful, powerful book talks about how it is it, it, to fear God and keep his commandments. This is the way we ought to live. This is the wise life that's lived. And we're going to take a look again at this passage, Ecclesiastes chapter 7. And I want to highlight a couple things just as we dive into it. First thing is to watch for the word better in these 14 verses that we're going to read. It shows up in seven of them. And the, 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 the word better is used to help us navigate through perspectives. Because what we're going to read isn't so much about active choices as far as you, cho- you have this pathway you can choose and you have this pathway you can choose. It's not so much about that, but it, it's a concerning perspective. It's concerning the way that we see things in life as we go through them. It's the way that we handle circumstances beyond our control and the way that our heart posture is in the midst of them, in the way that our mind perceives them and interacts with them. Watch for the word better in this. And then the the other thing, again, just that it is about perspective, that wisdom demands a godly perspective. As we do life, we've got to see things from God's point of view because his view is is so much more full than our point of view. His view is right, and our view can be clouded. And so we've got to have a godly perspective as we pursue wisdom. So let's take a look. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 1. And this, this part of wisdom literature starts off in this way. A good name is better than precious ointment. And we can pause there and say, okay, well, this, this makes sense. Our renown, our reputation is more valuable than, than a precious ointment or, or something where you can put monetary value on. A good name is, is far more valuable than that. And I don't think many people would argue that. I mean, you, you can see this. And the way that we live life, are, are you known as a person who is honest, as a person who is trustworthy, as a person who follows through? Or are you known as a selfish person? You know, as someone who would deceive. And, and a good name is so valuable, and we've got to pursue that. Then he goes on, he says, the day of death is better than the day of birth. Now, this one probably raises a few eyebrows. I know it does for me, okay? And let's continue on in verse 2. He says, it is better to go to the house of, a, house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind. The living will lay it to heart. He goes further. Sorrow is better than laughter. For by sadness of the face, the heart is made glad. What's going on here? Like, why would he say, if you've got a house of mourning, if you've got a spot where people are grieving and sad and sorrowful, that's better than to be at a party where everything's good and people are celebrating. Why is that one better than... Than that, and, and further, sorrow is better than laughter. Like, I like laughing. I, I I love enjoying a good time. I love you know that. So why is sorrow? I don't enjoy that. Why is that better than laughter? Maybe here's a little bit of what's going on here. Let, let's. Uh, the year was 1999, and me together with my. Uh, uh, she wasn't my wife at the time, but Amy, we were volunteers at a youth group. And we got a chance to, to lead a mission trip to Mexico and, and to do this. And we got a chance to, to take some high school students to the spot in Mexico and, and do this. And it was just a great, great time. And I saw God work during that week in powerful and profound ways. And so we got a chance to see God move in, in, 
this spot in Mexico. And it was great. Coming home was one of the most uh, challenging and interesting times of my life. Because we hopped uh, from southern Texas, we hopped on this small plane, and we flew. We were to fly to Dallas-Fort Worth, where we catch a bigger plane, to Detroit. And as we, as we sat on that small plane, we, we took off, and uh, shortly after takeoff, one of the engines caught fire, okay? Uh, people on the plane saw flames on that engine. They shut, shut it down. We saw the flight attendants book it, you know, to either end of the, ends of the plane. And we're like, hey, if they don't know what's going on, if they're not comfortable with this, I'm not comfortable with this. The plane dips a little bit, and it, it, within a minute or two, the pilot comes on, and he says, you know, folks, we, we lost an engine, okay? And we're going to, and, and his words at the time, he says, we're going to attempt to make an emergency landing at a different airport, a close to airport. We're going to land in Corpus Christi instead of Dallas-Fort Worth. And we're going we're gonna to do this. He had the flight attendants show us the crash, emergency crash position, okay? And so he says, we're going to attempt to make this landing in about 40 minutes. You guys, what that does to you cannot easily be put into words, okay? And in that moment, I, I kid you not, on this small airplane, there were, there were people singing, there were tears, there were people crying. And, and I'll tell you, what I, what I did the most was, was I prayed. And the prayers I prayed in those 40 minutes were some of the most sincere, gut-wrenching, deeply honest with my creator prayers that I've ever prayed in my life. And I, I tell you, I remember praying these, these exact words where I, uh, you know, shortly before we would do that landing, and I, I said, oh, Jesus, I might get to see you in like 20 minutes. Like this is, I mean, I've never been able to pray anything similar to that, you know, the rest of my life, okay? And so, so we had this, this amazing time. But, but this gets to the root of the matter, that sorrow is better than laughter, okay? That times of mourning or times of grieving are, are better than, than just a party, okay? Because what happens in those moments where we're grieving the loss of a loved one, where we have sorrow in our heart because of what's gone on around us, where we, where we contemplate where we're at in our humanity, in the short time that we have on earth, when we're considering those things at that level, that is far better from eternal perspective than any celebration or any party could ever be, okay? And by the way, um, we survived. It's cool. Uh, Amy and one of our students actually got interviewed on the local news at Corpus Christi Airport. The plane, you know, took up most of the runway, both left, right, forward, backward, emergency vehicles all there, news crews. I mean, it was, it was, it was really, really cool to be able to kiss the ground and, and, and all that stuff, okay? But, but it brought to light these, these thoughts that, hey, in these moments of, of grieving or sorrow or mourning, they are powerful, and we need to consider how God can use them in our lives. And so uh, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, verse 4, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. And so we need to go after this in our relationship with God, that wisdom demands a godly perspective. And maybe, just maybe, God can use those moments of grieving and mourning and loss where we consider things on, on a heavier level, that God can use those in profound ways. Verse 5, it is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of fools. This also is vanity. And so he's explaining here that in your life, as you seek to have this godly perspective, that it is better to hear the rebuke of a wise person than to hear the song of, the fool, uh, of fools. So in my life, I don't like being rebuked. I don't like when people come speak honest truth into my life. It's not fun, okay? It's not enjoyable. But it's good if I let it be good. And it's far more valuable than any song of, of, of celebration or pleasure or whatever that, that could be sung. That I need to realize that when good people speak honest truth into my life, that is far better than any sayings without substance. Okay? And he equates this in this, in this analogy where he says, For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of fools. Okay? 
if you, if you have a pot of stew that you want cooked, if you, if you have a pot of stew that you need to get warm, okay, you need to have a good fire underneath. And we, we live in Michigan. We, we know what a good campfire is all about. When you, when you cuddle up there with a, with a hoodie on, and, you know, there with friends around a good fire, and it's just radiating heat, and you kind of put your feet up to it for a little bit so you can't take it anymore, and then you, you bring them back, and you roast marshmallows on it. It just radiates good heat, and you just enjoy that, that time, okay? But a fire that, that burns really quickly and then fizzles out isn't of, of any value to a campfire or, or to cooking stew. And that's what's being described here, okay? It, the, the song of fools is kind of like taking that, that thin brush with thorns on it and saying, we're using this for firewood, and you're going to put it underneath the pot, and you're going to light it on fire, and, and it'll, it, it'll burn. It'll catch fire pretty quickly, but it'll be out pretty quickly. And it'll, it'll crackle, and it'll sound good. It'll look good for a moment. But it lacks substance that a log that has been burning on a fire for for some time is able to radiate that heat that you need to cook the stew or to have that warmth. And that's what's being talked about here. You want substance in your life? You need to let people speak difficult truths into your life. You need to open the door for people to, to rebuke you where you need it in life. If you want to live a wise life, this is what you've got to pursue. You know, uh, John Wooden was one of the greatest coaches in, in all of sports a- ever. And just this great, great coach. And he says this as part of his quote. He says, whatever you do in life, surround yourself with smart people who will argue with you. Great quote, right? Hey, that I've got to have smart people who are willing to speak truth into my life and not be afraid of of the way I'd respond. I've got to have people who will help me see blind spots in my life. And when I do that, I'll be a much wiser person. Wisdom demands a godly perspective. Verse 7, surely oppression drives the wise into madness, and a bribe corrupts the heart. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. And so as we live life, oppression or manipulation can can cause a person to stray off course, and, and we should obviously avoid these things as much as possible. Okay, a bribe, you know, the lure of money leads good people away from good goals. You've got to be careful of this. And so in verse 8, he says, Better is the end of a thing than its beginning, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. So why is the end of a thing better than the beginning of something? You know, uh, why, why is that so true? Uh, Todd on the siding project, I mean, is the end better than the beginning? Can I get an amen? <laughs> okay, maybe there's an element of that. But maybe also some of what's going on here is anybody can start a project. Anybody can start a task. But it takes a wise person who is willing to persevere through the ups and downs to finish something. I've got some friends who are runners, and recently they've run uh, half marathons and even marathons. And I mean, again, anybody can start a race, show up there, get your you know, your name tag or your tag, number tag, and your shoes on and and wear the running gear. Anybody can do that, okay? But the person who actually crosses that finish line, that's to be celebrated. Better is the end than the beginning. And so those people who, who champion following through, who live out perseverance in their lives, in the things that they take on, who say, I'm committing to starting this and I'm committing to seeing it through. That's a wise person right there wisdom demands a godly perspective. Verse 9, be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. And we'll all get angry at some point. I mean, it's, it's not a sin to become angry, but anger can lead to sins, as scripture describes. And so we need to be slow to become angry. We need to not be easily offended. We need to be wise in how quickly our our anger flares up and a wise person will guard their hearts in this. And the word picture given, again, is anger lodges in the heart of fools. And we have a danger when we are quick to become angry to have anger just lodged in our heart and having a place in our in our perspectives, in our well in, in the way that we live our lives. We have anger lodged in there and it it flares up if we let it into our heart. 
And so let's be a people that seek to be slow to become angry. Let's be a people that, that champion this cause that, hey, in order to be wise, I need to be not quick in my spirit to become angry. I need to live life in this way. We would do well to practice this on social media, Facebook and Twitter and, and all those, and, and just be careful and maybe pause and be slow to respond even in our emotions. Verse 10, say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, an advantage to those who see the sun. So uh, it's not wise for us to say, hey, those good old days today could never be like that. You know, I loved what was going on there, and this was, everything was better, everything was so good, and now things stink. Because, because we miss out on when we dwell in the past and miss the present and what's going on. More on this later as we finish up our, our passage. Uh, wisdom is good with an inheritance, an advantage to those who see the sun. Wisdom is, is to be sought after. It's, it's to be yearned for. It's good for us. Let's seek wisdom. Verse 12, for the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. And the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. Okay, money's good, okay? It can help you out. You need money to buy food, to have shelter, to, you know, money can help you out. I mean, make, make no mistake about it, okay? That's okay. But wisdom is far better than money could ever be, okay? Wisdom is going to preserve your life and your well-being in a way that money never, ever could. And wisdom is to be sought after far more than monetary riches. Verse 13, consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of, of adversity, consider. God has made this one as well as the other, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. So this gets back to, hey, why were the... Why are the old days so much better than right now? Okay? He's saying, hey, who, God has a purpose in every situation. God has, has ways that he can speak into your life, no matter what's going on, no matter your circumstance. But we've got to be keenly aware to what is going on. Wisdom demands this godly perspective that we see, who, how can I change what God has done? My circumstances around me, I can't do anything about this or that. Okay? Who can make straight what God has made crooked? Or who can make crooked what God has made straight? I can't change the circumstances around me, but I can consider that God has made one as well as the other. That God has a purpose in times of adversity. That God has a purpose in times of, of, of blessings. And, this, and God has a purpose in each and every one. And if I have a godly perspective, I'm looking at each and every day, each and every circumstance and saying, God, what do you want to teach me in this? God, how can you use me to show your love to a world that needs it in this difficult situation? God, you've blessed me with this. God, how can you use it for your purposes and for your kingdom? How do you want to use me to shine brightly for you? And if we consider this, if we consider that we can trust in God just as we sang about, if we consider that God has a purpose no matter what is going on, let's have that, that perspective. And when we do, watch how God will use you as we seek to love God and love people. Wisdom demands a godly perspective. And I want to finish by sharing this with you is uh, one, of, one of my favorite things to do with, with my kids is to, uh, in fall time, go to these corn mazes. It's been a lot of fun to take them through, and, it, and it's a fun journey because you have these, these uh, stalks of corn that are grown up, and you, you try to walk through, and it's difficult to navigate because as, as you're there, you know, you can't see over the corn. No comments on my height or lack thereof, okay? But uh, you can't see where you're going. And your kids certainly can't either. And so you make choices. Okay, is this going to be a dead end or is this going to go there? And there's one that we've gone to that's really cool where it has uh, these steps uh, for a bridge just in the middle of the corn maze. And you're able to climb up some 20-some feet and be able to see this amazing perspective of this maze that you've been struggling through for the past two hours and don't know how to get out, maybe. 
Uh, and so, so you're up on this bridge, but you have a different perspective. And it's so helpful. It's like, there is a way out. Hey, look at that. That spot, well, there's that dead end. Okay, we need to make sure that we go there. And it's helpful to see things from a different perspective. You see so much more. You understand so much more clearly than when you just keep on turning into dead ends and hitting the wall time after time after time. And this is much like what it's like to trust in God, where we have our limited perspective, but God sees everything so completely. And he's there willing to walk us through and help us through these times. We just have to trust in him and to seek to have a godly perspective. Wisdom demands a godly perspective. And may you be blessed today and this week and beyond as you seek to have this godly perspective. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this morning. God, this morning where we can come and sing your praises. God, this morning where we can come and fellowship together. God, for this morning where we can come and seek you through the study of your word. And Lord, may you bless each person here as we go from this place. Help us to open up our eyes and even our hearts to a godly perspective, a perspective that sees that you have a purpose in each and every situation. Lord, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great Sunday.